Pastor Josh Dockstetter here from Center Point Church in Montague, Prince Edward Island. Thank you for viewing this sermon from one of our weekly worship meetings. I do hope that it will encourage and challenge you towards a maturity in Christ. We at Center Point believe in the local church, and we want to remind you that this sermon should only support the role and influence that your pastor and church family should have on your life and not replace it. If you aren't a part of the local church, I want to simply say, don't rob yourself of the presence of others in gospel community, and don't rob others of your presence in gospel community. Find a church that preaches the word of God, makes much of Jesus, and is committed to discipleship. And may the following sermon enrich you in the gospel for the glory of God. Okay, if you want to take a seat, we will begin our time in God's Word together. As we continue to look through the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to ask that you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're looking at two verses today in the Sermon on the Mount. And next week we'll look at one. And many of you are thinking, man, this is a sermon that never ends. Uh, but I want to encourage you that um, I'm hoping that by the end of September we will be into Matthew chapter 7 and we will be finished by November. And then we will start Christmas uh, and get ready for that. And then my hope is in the new year to look at a book of the Old Testament and uh, see what God has for us there in the Old Testament. Um, and so, just so you're aware of what is coming, uh, there's, there is an end in sight, but I hope, um, you know, all joking aside, I hope that you've seen the wealth of the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 5 to 7. There is so much there. There's so much there for us to, to study, to just invest in, to allow God to speak to us through his word from Matthew chapter 5 to 7. And uh, I want to encourage you to, to keep the Sermon on the Mount um, in your hearts and in your minds as you live. The Sermon on the Mount is about kingdom life in this world. It's about gospel living. What does it look like to live out the gospel? We read it in Matthew chapter 5 into chapter the end of chapter 7. Today our passage is Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23. Let me read it for us. It will be on the screen behind me. There it is. I'm reading from the English Standard Version Bible. If you have a different Bible version, that's quite all right. You are still welcome here. And uh, we want to just, uh, we're thankful that you are here with us. Let's, let's read Matthew chapter 6, 22 to 23. This is God's word for us this morning. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. This is God's word for us this morning. We pray. Lord, we ask that you would... Bless the reading of your word, and then you would bless the preaching of your word. Father, we pray also that you bless the hearing of your word, and the living it out. Lord, give us healthy eyes, so that our whole bodies may be full of light. Lead us, O God. As we live in this world, we can get so consumed with worldly things. Lift our eyes to heaven, where Christ is seated, who is Lord over all. Lord, I pray for our family here today. May they be blessed. May we be drawn together. We pray for those who could not be with us through either through um, distance or through ailment. Lord, especially today, we think of Lauren and Lorraine, and we want to lift them up to you. We ask, God, for your blessing on them. We pray that you continue to lead them and that you provide for Lorraine a set of lungs. Father, we long to have them back with us, and we miss them dearly. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Well, as I said, the Sermon on the Mount is about true gospel living. And here, as he has been doing all along in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ calls us to a clearer, fuller picture of life in this world. Not simply a different way to live, but a clearer and fuller way of living. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in, in this passage here today, as he's done all along, is widening our gaze on life and life issues and how we are to live as followers of Christ in this world. He's widening our gaze and he's deepening our understanding of what life is truly about. How we are to live, why we live. And he's also, at the same time, while he's widening our gaze and deepening our understanding, he's also narrowing our focus in life. And he's doing all of these things at the same time. You know, this is, this is the interesting thing about how other people view Christianity, or maybe how we view Christianity ourselves, is that Christianity is not so narrow-minded that it is without a greater picture. And Christianity is not so open-minded that it is not without intricate details that provide a clearer picture. See, Christianity is not about being too narrow or too wide open. It's about the full picture. Christianity is about seeing the greatness of God, and yet even in the intricate details, we know that God is there. Even in the smallest of life issues, we, we can know that God is there. We can know that God has a plan and a purpose and that God is present with us. Even as we've come out of uh, the Lord's Prayer, we've seen the greatness of God. Hallowed be your name. And then we, we continue to ask Him for the, the intricate things. Lord, provide for me. Provide for what I need. Provide for my physical needs. Provide for my relational needs. And we see all of these things. That God is trying to, Jesus is trying to open our eyes to a full picture of how to live life in this world. And the problem that we face is that picture is diminished by our own self-concern, our own selfishness, our own self-centeredness. And these things can give way to what we've been talking about, just in case, we I know it's been a while since we've met together, but we're, we're getting into this section in the next couple of weeks on anxiety and worry. And in fact, we're actually there already because Jesus is, is showing the precursors to anxiety and worry. How we end up in this place of anxiety and of worry, and it's by focusing on the things of this earth and not on the things of heaven, as we looked at two weeks ago. Storing up treasures for ourselves on earth and not in heaven. Anxiety and worry is where we're going to be ending up in the next couple of weeks where Christ is calling us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Anxiety and worry arise out of misplaced perspective. Just as we looked at two weeks ago, misplaced treasure, here we look at what is a misplaced perspective we, remember how we talked about two weeks ago that anxiety and worry be, are, are not simply cured by positive thinking. As if that could somehow, the, the issue for anxiety and worry is negative thinking. That's just, I think bad. That that's the only thing that, that, that affects me, that brings anxiety and worry. No, rather... And the, the, the reason why we, we struggle with so much anxiety and worry is because we have untheological thinking. Because we don't think of the issues that we face in our lives in light of who God is and His greatness and His presence and His power to work even in the midst of the struggle. Even in the midst of the struggle. So we so often 
diminish our view of life, our lives and we make no room for God. God is just something I do on Sundays. God is just something I do when I kneel before my bed at night. God is just something we, we, someone we turn to or we speak to the air when, when uh, we, before a meal. But are we allowing God the space in our lives and our society today is no different as a whole. It's consumed with countless agendas and balances and advocacy and social justice and on and on the list goes that even those things that might be good things can become ultimate things and therefore become a bad thing. Because there's no place for God in that. See, we've become so fixed upon the workings of the world and the society that we live in that we often misplace our focus and our mission for life. And that ought to be God himself. So today we need God's word to confront us, to convict us, and convert us this morning. The point of this text here this morning is that Christians ought to have the greatest, fullest, clearest perspective for life in this world and beyond. We ought to have the greatest, fullest, clearest perspective for life in this world and beyond. So let me let me explain how we're going to approach this text today. There's three things. We're going to look at the illustration first. Then we're going to draw from the illustration information. And then lastly, we're going to draw from that information an interpretation. So three eyes: illustration, information, interpretation. Let's look first at the illustration that's given in verses 22 and verse 23. Jesus presents the eye as the lamp of the body in verse 22. He's moving out of verse 21 where he's talked about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You remember two weeks ago we talked about what the heart means in the Bible is essentially where your life is seated, where you've placed yourself. Where, you've, where, the, where your heart, where your very life has taken its seat, where it's at rest, where it, what it longs for, and from there he moves to the eye. Because of where our heart is placed, we are then positioned to see a certain perspective. And, but what does Jesus mean when he says the eye is the lamp of the body? How is the eye a lamp? Because the eye doesn't light up dark places, you know? Unless you're like Superman, have some kind of laser beams come out of your eyes. Your eyes are not lamps. They don't light up dark places. But what Jesus is getting at here is that the eye is important, if we think about it in its function towards the rest of the body, the eye exposes what's outside of the body. The eye exposes what's outside of the body. The eye takes in the light, because if this were a dark room, right, we wouldn't see very much or very clearly at all. The eye takes in light, which then enables the body to act appropriately. Because there's light in this room, I know where I'm to stand and where I can put my hand, for example. And, that, and thus I'm not swinging it in front of this pulpit or banging it on the pulpit. And I know that I can walk in such a way that I'm not going to trip and fall because my eye allows the rest of my body to function appropriately. It allows my hand, my foot to move in a way that doesn't harm myself and to move appropriately. And again, as I have mentioned, you ever tried moving around in a dark room? Yeah. We learn our lesson time after time again, right? Who left that there? Oh man, I tripped over and who forgot to put their, their drawers in? You stub your toe or hurt your knee? The eye is important for the function of the rest of the body. And Jesus here goes into, in verse 22, two conditions of the eye. A healthy eye and an unhealthy eye. He uses two forms to illustrate this functioning of the eye. First he talks about in verse 22, of a healthy eye. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes function the way they ought to, 
your whole body will function as if they can see for themselves, right? As if they can, as if they can move properly without causing injury or harm. Actually, the word that's used there in the Greek when it says, if your eye is healthy, is actually the word, if your eye is single. Some of your translations, I know the King James Version says, if your eye is single. That means if your eye is clearly focused. If you have singular vision. The whole body, if, there's, if the eyes function the way they ought to, there's clarity. Now contrast this with an unhealthy eye. And maybe some of you are facing the struggles of unhealthy eyes. There's numerous different forms that this can take in our world. Color blindness, nearsightedness, double vision, right? I think that fits very well with what Jesus is saying about singular vision. If your eye is single. Here he says, if your eye is unhealthy, if you have cataracts or if you have even blindness, you realize that those things affect the function of your body. Many of us have glasses in this room to help us see. And if we didn't have those glasses, we would then be stumbling over things. We wouldn't be able to properly read the signs as we're driving, right? Probably even a better illustration that fits with what Jesus is saying here is the illustration of a window in a room. If you don't have a window in a room, it's hard to have light in there without electricity, right? But if you have a window in, into a room that shines the sunlight in, then you can see properly. Now, the, the condition of that window affects how much light gets into that room, does it not? If the window is dusty, if the window is tinted in any way, if there's anything obstructing the window, then it, there's not much light that gets into the room. But if it's clear, it lights up the whole room. And so Jesus here is drawing a connection to how our eyes function to our bodies and how this, there's a deeper connection of the eye towards our spiritual lives. Kent Hughes, he's a pastor in the States, has said this, The spiritual light that comes into a man's soul depends upon the spiritual condition of the eye through which it passes. The spiritual light that comes into a man's soul depends upon the spiritual condition of the eye through which it passes. And so Jesus is essentially saying this, Be careful how you see. Be careful how you see and pay careful attention to how you look, how you see your perspective, not just physical perspective, but your perspective on life. Pay careful attention, not to just what you see, but how you see. So that's the illustration. Now let's draw from there so we get more information. Now we can stop right there. Many of you would be very happy. We can stop right there, and, and maybe that would be enough, and there is some great value there. But let's draw from, from this a little bit more information, because it can be a confusing uh, passage, what Jesus is saying. We want to take it further by looking at two things. First of all, we want to look at the greater con the context of this uh, section, these two verses, where they fit in the Sermon on the Mount. We do this by looking at the verses before and the verses after to get a little bit more of an understanding of what Jesus is trying to say, and this is very helpful. If we look at the verses before, which we looked at two weeks ago, verses 19 to 21, we get this illustration about treasure in heaven and treasure, treasure in heaven or treasure on earth. You remember, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so we have this contrast of heaven and earth. And then after this verse, that these verses that we're looking at today, verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Here we're given another contrast. Two masters, God and money, or God and earthly things. 
And so we, we have these contrasts in the verses before and in the verses after. And we can apply them to the same contrast that we see in verses 22 and 23, where we have a healthy eye that has singular vision. And that, that is to say, if we have healthy eyes, our eyes will be fixed on what? Our eyes will be fixed on God and His kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And our eyes will be fixed on, on who God is. He will be our master. He will be our treasure. He will be the focus. He will be the sight by which we see. And then we can take the unhealthy eye and see that the unhealthy eye are those who look to the things of this earth to fulfill them. The treasures of earth. Or mammon, as we read in verse 24. You cannot serve both God or mammon, or God and money. So this is what, it, what the context is putting what it means to have healthy vision, or healthy spiritual vision like. Now let's look at the greater context of the Bible. This is very important. This is very helpful. There's a passage just a few pages over. In Matthew 20. Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. It's very interesting where that parable is placed. It's a parable, a story that Jesus tells about some workers in a vineyard. And it's placed right after his encounter with the rich young ruler. And so, in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 15, or 1 to 16 rather, we read the story of these vineyard workers who are waiting to be employed. And this, this, this um, man who owns a vineyard goes and finds these servants, these workers, and says, hey, come work with me. He goes in the morning and they, he, he calls them to work and he says, I'll pay you a denarius, that is a day's pay, for you to come work for me. And they think, well, that's pretty good, okay. Fair enough, let's go. Um, and they go and they work in the vineyard for the day. And the, the, the vineyard owner keeps coming back at different times throughout the day. He goes back in the later morning, and he goes back at noon, and he goes back in the afternoon, and he goes back in the very evening. And he's still calling people to work in his vineyard. Some have worked for all day. Some have worked for, you know, five hours. Some have worked for three hours. Some have worked for two hours. And some have only worked for one hour. And at the end of the day, he calls all of these servants together, and he pays them. And the people who, the servants who are working all day, look to these servants who are only working maybe an hour, and seeing that the master is giving out to them a denarius as well. A full day's wage for working an hour. And they look and they think, what? That, that makes no sense. How is that fair? And they look and they start to start to uh, be bitter with their master. And read what look at what the master says in Matthew chapter twenty. Now, I'll read verse eleven so you get the understanding down to verse um, fifteen. And on receiving it, that is, those who worked all day, grumbled at the master of the house, saying, The last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal with us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, the master said to them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Now, you're thinking, what on earth does this have to do with Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23? Well, if you look at verse 15 of Matthew chapter 20. The last line of verse 15 says, Or do you begrudge my generosity? Some of you might have a little footnote that says at the bottom, Is your eye bad because I am good? Is your eye bad because I am good? It's almost verbatim, it's almost quoted exactly what's written in verse 23. If your eye is bad. If you want further indication of what this means, 
what this means, we can look to other passages in the Bible. There's many there. Deuteronomy 15.9 talks about looking at someone who's poor with a stingy look, with a begrudging look, with a bitterness in your eye towards them. There's an example in 1 Samuel 18.9 where Saul begins to eye David in a negative way. He gives him the evil eye. You remember Saul gets jealous over David's successes? Saul the king looking at this little shepherd boy and eyes him. And, and there's numerous other places. Proverbs 23 verse 6, Proverbs 28 verse 22 all speak of having evil eyes. Evil eyes. You see, the focus of the eye for these workers in Matthew chapter 20 is that they were stingy, that they were selfish, that they were material, that they were envious. They've seated themselves, that is their heart, at the center of the situation, and they've become ignorant of seeing grace and goodness. Instead of seeing their master being gracious and good towards those who have only worked an hour and thinking, hey, I'm going to pay them extra, these workers who have worked a full day think, what gives? And as a result, because they're so fixed on themselves, they cannot see the grace and goodness of the master who has employed them to work. And keep in mind, the master didn't cheat them out of anything. They agreed upon a denarius, did they not? They came and worked for him for a day's pay. He's giving them a day's pay. Yet... They become so stingy, they become so selfish, they become so greedy, they can't even see the grace and goodness of this master. What does this mean for us? What is this trying to get through to us? Well, there's two things. Let us draw an interpretation from these verses in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, in light of what we've seen in the rest of Scripture. Two things that I want to ask you today. Are you aware of your condition? Are you aware of your own need? Are you aware of the location of your heart? Are you aware of the direction in which your life is taking? Are you aware of the master in which you are serving here today? Or are you fixated upon the things of earth? Are you desiring, are, are, you, are you obedient to the desires of self rather than the desires of God? Are you so self-focused that when you see someone else doing well, that you think, why is that not me? Why can't I have that? Why can't I just get a break? I mean, look, God, I've been serving you this many years, and this one person comes and who has a horrible background, who has experienced horrible things, and they experience the grace of God, and they, things start to go well for them? Are we so self-focused that we cannot see the grace of God towards one sinner who is in rebellion against God, who repents and turns to Christ. I mean, friends, Scripture tells us that there is much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. And yet, here on earth, we become so self-focused. We become so inwardly self-centered that we cannot celebrate the blessing of God towards others. Or, maybe on the flip side, we become so self-obsessed or so self-centered that we can't give to those who are in need. That we can't look to people who are wrestling and struggling in life and facing hardship and difficulty that we just think, well, good luck. 
See, both of those things ignore the grace of God in someone's life. Are you so fixated on the things of earth that you cannot celebrate with people or even forgive them when they've wronged you? Think for a moment, friends, of the passage, like I mentioned, that comes before Matthew chapter 20 in Matthew 19, the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And really what that was was him just saying, hey, I'm a good person. If anyone deserves eternal life, it's me because I can do it. Look at what I've done. I'm successful in my life. I've done all of these things. I've gotten mine. Be bad. But Jesus says to him, I don't think you understand grace. Because you're still fixed on these things of the world. Give. Give. These things that have a place in your heart, where your heart is seated. Give those things away and then come and follow them. The man walks away sad. Because he had many possessions. See, his eye was unhealthy. He was so, he thought he was so aware of who he was. Jesus revealed to him the nature of his heart through the vision of his eye. J.I. Packer says this, laying up treasure on earth is dangerous because such treasure destroys spiritual awareness. If your eyes are filled with light and working properly, your body will be able to move easily and safely. If you can't see clearly, you will lack physical ease and poise. Similarly, if your heart is possessed by what this world and this life offers, you will not be able to see spiritual issues clearly, and when you read the Bible, its full meaning will escape you. I'm not doing it. So much so that Jesus says in verse 23 that we can get to the place where we are actually deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness, he says. You think that you're walking in the light. You think that you can see clearly. But really, you're just deceiving yourself. And you're just heaping up for yourself more and more darkness because you're so fixated on the things of this world and you're not keeping your eyes fixated on heaven. Where is your spiritual awareness? Where do you sit today? Maybe some of you say, I don't know. The second question is, where is your focus in life? We talked about spiritual awareness, now where is your spiritual focus? Is the things that you are focused on in this world enough? Or do you need to supplement it somehow? Is it family and a little bit of Jesus? Is it my job? Is it my success? And a little bit of family or a little bit of Jesus? What is it that your life is driven towards? See, the focus of your life affects the big picture of your life. J.C. Ryle says this. If your eye is single... Looking at this passage, if your eye is single, if it's healthy, your whole body will be full of light. J.C. Ryle says, singleness of purpose is one great secret to spiritual prosperity. Singleness of purpose is one great secret to spiritual prosperity. You see, the people who did much in this world, friends, for the kingdom of heaven, were the people who had the kingdom of heaven as their sole focus. They thought the most of eternity. That they have had a full picture of life. Yes, they encountered struggles. Yes, they had to battle their way through life. But friends, their focus, their perspective was in what enabled them to walk 
in such a way that even when they were downtrodden, even when they struggled, they were shining lights to those in need. Because they fixed their eyes on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Contrast this with the way our world is today. We jump from one thing to another. Where we don't have singleness of purpose, we have plurality of purpose. I found my purpose in this, and this, and this, and this, and that makes me feel good about myself and who I am. And none of those things, none of those things are lasting as we looked at two weeks ago. They're moth-eaten and rusty, and they're, they're able to be taken from you. So my question is, in regards to your spiritual focus, do you have eyes for God alone? Or are your eyes wandering to other things? Again, maybe the greatest illustration for this is in marriage. Oh. I myself am to have eyes for my wife alone. And God has said this is good. This is good. This is a good thing. I'm to have eyes for Krista alone. Now, the world would look at that and say, oh man, just you're wasting your time. Or that's just so narrow. Or they would say that you're just robbing yourself of experiences that you have. But I I can say. But I found the opposite. Focusing on my wife as an example, to have eyes for her alone, this doesn't lessen my experiences in life. It actually deepens it. Because it deepens my love for another person. It deepens their love for me. Because through this, there's more to know, there's more to experience, there's more to discover. I mean, I just didn't stand on my wedding day and say, I do, and great, see you later, you know. I pledged my entire life, and that's, that's how our eyes ought to be for God. We have to fix our eyes towards God so that it might deepen our focus, it might deepen our experiences, not rob us of them. Because, friends in God, you can never exhaust the greatness and goodness of God. You can never exhaust. If you set your purpose and your focus on the Lord and the Lord alone, you can never exhaust, exhaust the wealth and the riches of the goodness and glory of God. There's more to know. There's more to experience. There's more to discover. And friends, the point of all of this is surrender. Mm -hmm. The point of all of this is surrender. That our whole lives are to be focused on the one thing that truly matters. And it's this surrender, this surrender that brings about a healthy eye that fills our entire bodies full of light. It's this surrender that is the only substance of life that is truly life. You want to know life and life to the full? You look to God. You look to Jesus. You don't look to the things of this earth. See, Jesus is trying to get our attention. He's saying this is what is key to understanding the kingdom of God. It's by seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And so clear sight is the absence of distractions. It's the presence of focus and understanding. So I ask you today, where is your focus placed? Is it on yourself? Is it on earthly things? Because followers of Christ ought to have the greatest, fullest, clearest perspective of life in this world and beyond. And that comes through surrendering ourselves to Christ. It's because of this that we can see the one who is truly light. Genesis 1 verse 3. The first words of God in the Bible. Where God speaks. In the Bible, the first recorded words that he spoke is the words, Let 
there be light. Let there be light. God separates the light from the darkness. And friends, if you are in Christ, this is what God has said to you. If you are in Christ today, you're truly believing in Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, God says to you, let there be light. And he separates the darkness of your soul from you. And fills your whole body with light. <clears throat> fills your whole body with light. See, friends, the darkness in us is great. It's confusion, it's blindness, it's corruption, it's damnation, and it's destruction. And God has separated the darkness from us in Christ Jesus because Christ himself took the darkness upon himself that we might have light. And by the light of Christ, because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, we can then see properly, we can see purposefully, we can see truthfully, we can then see completely, friends. Because it's by Christ and Christ alone that you may see God. It's not by your good deeds, it's not by the things that you have, the successes in your life, the experiences of your life, it's by Christ and Christ alone. And so friends, today, my plea to you is to take hold of Christ. Take hold of Christ. Let him be the light that opens your eyes to see, that you may say, as the, the hymn says, once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see. Take hold of Christ today. He is your true treasure. He is your true light that shines in a dark world. And friends, when we see our brothers and sisters struggling, we remember the grace of God towards us who are in sin. And when we see our brothers and sisters rejoicing, may we celebrate the grace of God in their lives. May we be able to sing God's praise. May we be able to fix our eyes on the one who truly is Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray this morning. Our God, how great is your name in all the earth. Lord, we ask that this morning you would open our eyes, that our eyes would be healthy. That we'd be aware of the nature of our souls, that we would examine ourselves. And Father, if we find in ourselves a need to repent, God, things that we have not surrendered to you, things that we have held on to because we'd like to be in control, or we would like to be the ones who, this is our security, or this is our comfort, or this is what gives us a sense of purpose, Lord, may we... Surrender them to you. Knowing that God is only in you and in you alone. We have life and life to the full. Open our eyes that we may see, O oh Lord. Fix our eyes on you. That you may be the King and Lord and Savior of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>